Hello, the awesome tutor. And today we're going to be looking at the role of Governor George Arthur. And what's different about Governor George Arthur, uh, in terms of comparing him to the other governors, is that he did not govern New South Wales, so Australia. He governed Van Diemen's Land, which was basically Tasmania. So, this guy had a very sort of totalitarian rule. He divided the area into police districts, and unlike Macquarie and Philip, he was not lenient with the convicts. Okay? In Van Diemen's land, it was established as a penal colony in 1803, and basically it was the prison within the prison, because Australia was the penal colony, and I have another penal, a penal colony in Tasmania. So that's where they send the worst offenders. So what you have here is a group of hardened, let's call them riffraff, okay? Don't, don't use that word, obviously, in, the, in, in an essay, but that, that's basically what they were. And so, he did not take it a liking towards them. There were no um, early pardons, and he had something called blacklisting and redlisting, meaning that if you fraternized with the convicts, or you did not do um, what George Arthur, or you, you did not follow policy, you did not conform, or you dissented, then you would be either blacklisted or redlisted. Blacklisted meaning um, labor that, that, that you have in terms of the convict labor that you are assigned would be withdrawn, and redlisting is a warning that it would be withdrawn. So George Arthur maintained a totalitarian control or rule over the area through this threat of withhold of withdrawing labor. Okay? Now, let's go back to this hardened riffraff. In order to survive and then find food, they were given guns in order to hunt kangaroo. But when you have these hardened convicts, and you give them guns, and you have an aborigine population there, in Van Diemen's land, things are not going to end so well for the people who don't have the guns. So this basically created a class of uncontrolled and armed Bush grinders, which basically initiated something called the Black War, which was at its highest intensity in the 1820s, where Aborigines were hunted, starved, and poisoned until they were driven out or wiped out completely. In 1803, when the penal colony was established in Van Diemen's land, there were about 3,000 to 4,000 Aborigines in the area. The last Aborigine died in 1876. So well, the population was reduced to zero, the indigenous population. So obviously a detrimental, highly disastrous impact on the Aborigine population. Now, in terms of how far this can be considered a genocide, some historians call it genocide, but some historians like Keith Windshuttle, he argues against uh, labeling the genocide. Um, I think he said something like, Van Diemen's land was host to nothing that resembled genocide, which requires murderous contention against the whole race of people. So perhaps his interpretation is that perhaps it was not a intentional or, or directly driven by British policy to get to kill off the Aborigine population, but perhaps it was somewhat of a side effect of settling in the area. And he also uh, attributes the Aborigine deaths more so towards um, a few uncontrollable and extreme convicts, and also disease. Disease was brought in 1803 when the first whalers arrived. Um, yeah, so he does not deem it a genocide, but that's arguable and debatable. Now, in terms of economy, it was actually the main area for whaling and sealing. 
In fact, in 1805, I believe, or was it 1806? It's 1805 or 1806. Um, some guy called Robert Campbell. He took 260 tons of seal oil, taken obviously from the area around Van Diemen's Land, and he went to London, exported it obviously, traded with it, and what that did is it broke the East India Company's monopoly on trade. So the, the business endeavors in the area were so profitable that it was able to break a company as large as the East India Company's monopoly. And that obviously contributed towards the free trade um, of seal goods and whaling goods and wool. Okay, so the economy was doing very well. Not the Aboriginal population, but the economy. Now, I haven't focused on the impact on the Aboriginal population of these other governors in New South Wales um, in, my, in my videos, but you can't, you can't forget them and their impact on the Aborigines. Okay, um, what was different in New South Wales, in Australia, was that there was more of a limit or control to the impact on the Aborigines instead of the disaster that it was in Van Diemen's land. Especially under governors like Macquarie and Philip, where they were perhaps more lenient, or they tried to establish some sort of mutual understanding. Now don't get me wrong, they still killed some, Abri some Aborigines, but it was more so punitive in terms of punishing them for retaliation rather than directly going in and actively killing off the population. You also had, of course, the smallpox epidemic in 1789, which killed off 50% of the coastal Aborigine population. Okay? One thing I forgot to mention is that Governor George Arthur imposed martial law on the Aborigines in 1828, forcing their relocation into other settled areas within Van Diemen's land. But it wasn't really successful. I mean, imagine this. You have a completely different culture. The disparity between the, the white settlers and the Aborigines is so large, and they can't understand each other. They can't. And so what that led is to a lot of complications and misunderstandings, and so the martial law that uh, Governor George Arthur imposed wasn't really effective in relocating them, but it did lead to more Aborigine deaths. Yep, um, this has been the awesome tutor. Bye.